people are talking about the regional comprehensive economic partnership. It includes China, Japan, Vietnam, and more. Is that a threat, quote unquote, to the U.S.? Well, I would have said it's mostly a geo politics threat rather than an economic threat. I mean, it's not, not likely to be any kind of tight economic integration. Uh, these countries are just too diverse and too you know, distrustful of each other in fundamental ways. Um, but it does mean that to the extent that there's rule setting, uh, you know, we won't be at the table and China will. Uh, and to the extent that there's a, um, uh, just a general sense of who, who are you looking at, it, it, when people I had lots of conversations about TPP, and the question for, for Obama administration people was, why are you doing this? The economic case is really not all that compelling, and they always said, geopolitics, we have to be at the center of this stuff, and not going to happen. But you know, here's what, quick, quick focus here. If the U.S. is not in your trade deal, what are you going to do as an exporting current account surplus country? you got to sell to somebody. We're the biggest consumer in the world. Isn't that leverage in deals with China, in leverage in a deal with the EU where, Ch where Germany is so trade dependent? Isn't that the reason why people are going to have to deal with the U.S. and deal with Trump? Well, they'll all have to deal with. Nobody's going to cut us off. Nobody's going to say, oh, we, we don't, you know. But what, what are we going to do? Are we actually going to go and, and, I mean, maybe under Trump, maybe we'll go, you know, start just breaking, breaking our commitments say rip up the WTO and start imposing tariffs, uh, but that's a heck of a step. And as, as my old teachers used to tell me, the danger is not retaliation, it's emulation. The whole system falls apart if we do that. So are we willing to go down that route? Maybe, but if we're that crazy, then I don't think you know the, uh, the leverage is going to matter one way or the other. This is a, a, a question on a lot of uh, eco, our eco team here at Bloomberg News yeah. Mind, a question from my fellow reporters, Craig Torres, asking about NAFTA. Why hasn't Mexico been able to move up the value chain more substantially? Why is it exporting low labor costs? Why haven't they developed intellectual properties? Doesn't it show this was simply a low-cost wage arbitrage for American companies where both American and Mexican workers really didn't win? I think that's the big rap against a lot of these trade deals. Multinationals win, their shareholders win, but workers didn't. I think if you want to make the case for Mexican uh, benefits, you really want to look at you need to look at Mexico regionally. If you only look at those five northern states of Mexico, uh, it get a very, very different story. One piece of Mexico actually has converged significantly on the U.S. So it's not it's not zero. Now it's still disappointing, no question. Uh, people who thought that you know Mexico was going to be the next South Korea have been very, very disappointed. And then we have to ask, well, okay, it turns out that just being open to international trade isn't enough. And, the, and Mexico has problems of infrastructure, has problems of education, it has problems of corruption. Development is tricky. Some we, you know, no one really knows how to do it, and it's uh, uh, it, NAFTA by itself wasn't enough. Now for the U.S., yeah, to some extent it's wage arbitrage, but you know that some of that is actually helping U.S.-based enterprises compete with third parties. So I'm not going to claim that it was a great thing for workers on either side of the border, but it's certainly not the the demonic thing that some people portray it as. I want to ask you about the border adjustment tax. In the, in the sense of, in part, its supporters say it's very important in Paul Ryan's budget plan because if you want to cut taxes, you have to pay for that. And one very low-cost way to do that is with a border adjustment tax. Do you agree? Well, it's not really low cost, right? A border adjustment tax is paid, you know, an import tax is paid by U.S. consumers the same as, as any other tax. It's the idea that it's somehow going to fall on foreigners or anything. Like that. It's just a different tax. And, there, you know, there are different kinds of border adjustment tax. There's the, the kind that everybody with, that has a VAT has, where it's really just part of a sales tax. Then there's this really, you know, the uh, uh, DBCFT, which is a real you know, triple naproxen uh, uh, concept. It's very, very it, it's ser serious headache inducing, but there it's, it's much more complicated. But again, it's, it's not clear that it's any kind of real revenue alternative. It's just a way of shuffling around uh, who bears the corporate profits tax. And in the end, since the, the end of any, you know, at, at, at the end of these proposals is always going to be that U.S. corporations end up paying less, and that means that U.S. consumers are going to end up paying more.